Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar today um, on navigating the UX hiring skills gap in 2024, insights and strategies for universities and colleges. I'm really excited to be joined today by uh, uh, some great panelists who I'm going to ask to introduce themselves in a minute. Um, but for the moment, my name is Rachel. I'm Head of Research and Insights here at the UX Design Institute and really excited to be hosting uh, this, this great conversation today. Um, I'll start off by just outlining what we're going to cover. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we'll have a quick intro from, from our panelists, and I'll also tell everybody just a little bit about the UX Design Institute. And uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the State of UX Hiring Report 2024. This is a report that we launched just yesterday, um, and the report is what our insights are, are based off. Um, so those insights are going to be the basis for our three discussion points. So we're going to talk about demand for UX skills, educational requirements for, for launching a career in UX, and then we'll discuss a little bit about the impact of AI on the UX industry and a couple of predictions for, for what we think is going to happen there. Um, I'll also leave some time at the end for Q&A. Um, in terms of submitting your questions, you'll see that you have both a chat box and a questions box there uh, that you can interact with. Um, so please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat if you'd like to and um, tell us where, where you're, you're joining us from and, and what you do. Um, but if you have a specific question for our panelists um, or for us here at the UX Design Institute, um, please just make sure to put that in the questions box. It just means that we won't miss your question, um, but it will also give you a chance to vote for questions in there. So if you see a question that you'd really like to know the answer to, make sure to give it a vote because when I come to the q and I'll um, take a look at the top voted questions first and make sure we, we get those answered. Okay, so I'm going to ask each of our panelists to, to introduce themselves and I think we'll just go in order of, of the pictures on slide <laughs> for simplicity. So Dave, I'll start with you if you don't mind. Yeah, no problems at all, Rachel. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are coming into us on this planet. Uh, my name is Dave Kieran. Uh, I'm an educator, a professor of marketing and entrepreneurship, more specialized into the digital e-commerce world. I had a background in e-commerce and digital marketing prior to becoming an educator. Nice. Thanks, Dave. It's great to have you. Hey, everybody. You. Um, Hi, everybody. My name's Owen. Um, I'm the Alumni Career Advisor here at UX Design Institute. So I'm involved with uh, preparing our students for, for starting their, their careers in, in the field of UX design or UI design. And uh, I have about a decade of recruitment experience, uh, mostly focused on the tech sector. So uh, ranging from everything from the front end development through UX, UI, etc. And I've worked at a various range of companies starting with small scale startups right through to large tech giants. Nice. Thanks, Owen. Perfect. And uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Jerry. Um, I'm a HR recruitment professional. Um, for the last three years, I've been working in an agency in Dublin as a senior tech recruitment manager, and I'm kind of specializing in the product and design space um, that actually started like three years ago, I, I placed Owen and he was my first placement. And I think my love of design roles just kind of grew from there as well. Well, we're very thankful to you, Jerry, for that for that great placement, because uh, uh, Owen is an absolute solid member of, of the team here. Um, but it's it's great to have you all join us on the webinar. So thank you all so much. And I'm looking forward to your, your contributions. contributions. OK, so I'll just introduce the, the UX Design Institute briefly. Um, so we are a, an education provider in the UX space and, and we pride ourselves on uh, providing the gold standard in UX education across the globe. Um, all of our courses are university credit rated and also industry approved um, by our uh, industry advisory panel. Uh, that's made up by uh, some of the, the leaders in top uh, tech companies across the globe. Um, so their job is to make sure that we are teaching the, the skills that hiring managers are looking for and that are relevant to industry. Um, so we provide uh, education in UX design, UI design, product design, uh, content design, user research, and also uh, software and coding um, in terms of its relevance for UX. So, you know, how UX professionals can work with uh, software developers. Um, so yeah, that's our full range of courses. 
what we try to do is to, to have education available to UX professionals right from when they, they launch their career and the full way through their career as well um, as they continue to grow and upskill. Um, so that is a little bit about us. Um, I'm going to move now just to briefly also introduce the State of UX Hiring Report. Um, as I mentioned, we've launched that just yesterday. Um, and really this report is uh, aimed to be a practical guide to how to land a job in the UX industry. Um, so the data uh, for this report was collected via a survey um, that was open to any UX professional living anywhere in the world. Um, so it was a global survey, but we found that most of our respondents were living in uh, the UK, the US um, and Europe as well. Um, and we had over 500 UX professionals uh, take part in that survey. Um, so for the survey, we grouped people into two categories. We had um, just over 300 uh, respondents that we categorized as recent hires. So they have broken into the UX industry within the last four years. And they were asked a bit about their experience of navigating the jobs market and what helped them successfully transition into a role in UX. And then we had over 100 um, people who are actually responsible for hiring in their current role, specifically for hiring UX professionals. And they were asked a bit about what they'd look for uh, from an entry level candidate, you know, what priority skills you need to have to be successful in UX, and also a bit about their predictions for the demand for UX skills um, this year and, and into the future as well. So on that note, we're going to kick off with the first topic where we're going to talk about demand for UX expertise. And before I invite the, the panel, panelists to discuss this, I'll just give some high level findings from the report to kind of set the scene for what we're going to talk about. Um, so overall, um, you know, the key takeaway here is that projections for demand are, are really positive. Um, so we found that over two thirds of those responsible for hiring um, say they expect demand for skills to increase over the next one to two years. And roughly the same proportion also said that they expect to hire UX professionals this year. Um, so that, that was the findings of our report. We also wanted to look to, to other industry reports to see uh, what we could find. Um, so the World Economic Forum predicts that AI will create 92 million new digital jobs by 2030. And they're also forecasting that design and user experience will be a top 10 priority skill for businesses between 2023 and 2027. We also looked to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And here we found that their prediction for the employment of web developers and digital designers. So digital designers is kind of a, an overarching catch all, but it includes the work of UX designers. And they're projecting a growth of 16% from 22 to 32. Um, and this is much faster than, than for other occupations uh, that they looked at. And finally, then we have Forrester, which is forecasting that global tech spend will reach 4.7 trillion in 2024. So that represents a growth of 5.3% and is also a significant improvement on 2023's growth, growth which was 3.5%. So overall, both the findings from, from our report and, and larger industry reports are kind of all pointing to the same optimistic outlook. Um, but what we want to talk about today is what do our panelists believe is driving this projected demand? Um, what industries do they think, you know, will see this demand materialize? And also important, importantly for, for our audience today, how can university and college professionals prepare their students to take advantage of this increasing demand and really, you know, jump into to this thriving UX industry? So I'm going to hand over to our panelists now to discuss this topic for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, my role from here on out is going to be keeping us on time. Um, so forgive me if I jump in, in in a couple of minutes, but please, guys, take it away, whoever would like to, to kick us off. Um, yes. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, you know, I can start off with, and, and I can start off by saying, you know, we, you know, advancement in technology, we're moving towards, of course, user-centered design more and more and more with the leverage of technology around us, the use of mobile phones, the most element, and even with AI coming and AI being here, uh, there is this element towards this direction of how do we get more connected, more engaged with 
these individuals, our customers at the center of that pivot point. Yeah. I also think that uh, UX has become quite a kind of a fundamental part of businesses now, whereas previously it would have been seen as kind of the creative side, but, and you can also see that in how, um, the kind of job titles are now being labeled as product design as opposed to UX design. Um, fundamentally, they can be quite similar things, but it's it's really because they kind of are showing that this is fundamental to the revenue of the business as well. So you have the digital products, which do have, of course, that customer experience, but it has the revenue um, add as well. So I think that that's, that's definitely one thing that's pushing that as well. Mm -hmm. I would I would tend to agree, but I'm also seeing a lot more, uh, a lot more sort of, um, I suppose, merging of different roles. So, for example, there is actually a great deal of overlap between uh, digital marketing now and and UX as uh, as you know digital market, uh, marketing projects actually take on greater levels of complexity. And obviously, uh, as Dave mentioned, with the adoption of new technologies such as AI, there's uh, there's a lot of unknowns with regards to the usability of those interfaces. Um, so this is actually a key. Uh, a key goal for mainstream business uh, to actually adapt and actually, I suppose, not just adapt, but actually implement from, from the get-go in the right fashion. Um, failed implementation of AI already is actually impacting businesses quite negatively if it's, if it's done in a haphazard man manner, as in it, it will reduce uh, trust and reduce, uh, well, do, do serious damage reputationally. Um, so this is actually something that is front of mind for a lot of hiring managers that I speak to on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I think, and the other thing I think that does play off this element is again, you know, we're talking about that UX element, we're talking about that experience piece, but also playing into the data analytics and the data, the information. Uh, I love what you're saying, my friend, because I we see this trend. It, UX was really focused into big tech companies, but now we're seeing this divulge a broadening out. Mm -hmm. And, and spread it into other areas and other sort of elements, like you said, would like to say, like in the e commerce of world of how do we create an omni channel experience? How do we leverage AI and artificial intelligence to, you know, make sure that our chat bot is actually working effectively to engage and create that engagement with our customers? Yeah, those are those are great points, guys. A couple of things I want to hone in on that you mentioned, and, and Dave, you just mentioned it there about this kind of broadening out and. And something, you know, I'd love to get your perspective on from each of you is, you know, where are we seeing this growth? Are there particular industries that are kind of, you know, catching up on this UX revolution and, and kind of seeing the benefit, seeing the business benefit and, and trying to get on board with that? You know, do you see that in, in particular industries? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just from kind of the types of clients that I'm working with um, at the moment, I mean, Obviously, in the last few years, or you know, the fintech has been so far forward and so far advanced. But there's other industries. Health has been something that you know, in the last couple of years, definitely, especially that um, it's 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 really been something that UX is becoming a part of. I think it's any industry where um, the digital experience can help the physical experience. Um, so I was talking to a, a leader in one in aviation recently. That's another area as well, because you're before you even go to the airport, they want to make sure that you are kind of checked in that everything's, you know, um, everything's going well. You know, some airlines are maybe better than others at that. Um, and it, it is always, you know, trying to get there. But um, those are definitely areas. And I think really interestingly, uh, retail is, is something that I think is going to actually um, change in the next uh, number of years as well. They kind of I think retail, um, it's never going to go away completely. Obviously, e-commerce has taken a lot of that. But what retail wants to do now is they kind of want to look at what um, some museums have been doing, that they've been making this kind of immersive experience um, from an Irish standpoint, even you know, looking at uh, the Titanic Museum, um, for example, in Belfast. And they just kind of want to make this actually an experience for their customers that go in. So I think that those will be real key areas as well that will, will grow for sure. If I back you up, Jerry, on the definitely on the retail for sure, like we've got augmented reality that's now moving into that physical space. And how does that implement into a physical space and, and kind of building that digital and physical space together into that omnichannel channel approach to uh, But uh, yeah, and healthcare uh, is huge. Uh, I think in other areas that definitely are coming in, in interesting areas of like government sector. 
How do we take people's taxes? How do we make it more efficient? How do we create those pieces? We're seeing a lot of a cross synergy. And that's why I say it's broadening out. It's going to, people are saying, oh, look at the efficiencies. If we can create the user experience and create a more effective user experience and getting the individual to the answer, the problem they're trying to solve and get to the solution really quickly and efficiently. Yeah, I tend to agree there, uh, but uh, uh, other areas that I have been seeing a bit of growth in, in terms of things is like, for example, the traditional finance sector. Um, so yeah, basically the traditional finance sector is actually experiencing a lot of threat from challenger banks, for example, and that is the you know, digital native uh, platforms. So essentially what we're seeing is an increase in the need for traditional banks to be to remain competitive in this space. Uh, and that is fuel and growth of, of adoption of UX practices in, in that domain. Um, additionally, though, um, I, I suppose like with regards to the scale of, of these these, uh, these roles, obviously traditional banking sector and finance actually have a large scale uh, large scale presence, and actually also does in fact uh, require quite rapid transformation in this regard. So. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks, um, everybody, for that. I I just have see one or two questions that have come in specifically to this conversation, so I might just uh, share those with you. But um, we have one question asking about the insurance industry and just saying that submitting a claim is a horrendous experience. <laughs> um, are you seeing much much prospect there, or much a kind of uh, embracing of UX in in that industry? I would actually, I, I mean, that, that would follow on from what I'm, uh, I was just discussing. So traditional finance, but also, you know, insurance actually kind of falls under that umbrella. And we are definitely seeing an increase, uh, especially considering the the standard brokerages for insurance uh, are increasingly, well, they're, they're losing market share, whereas there's more direct uh, access via digital channels. So that definitely is fueling growth in that sector. It all comes back to the CX customer experience becomes the competitive advantage. The USP and the future USP is going to be, how do I service my customers? How do I service my customers efficiently effective? They're going to get the business. The other institutions will, will need to change and adapt. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, and another question here, and I think um, Jerry and Owen, you're probably particularly well suited to, to address this question, but it's around the demand in terms of seniority levels. So, you know, um, is, is the demand for, for senior designers? Um, and, and what this person is saying is that it does seem like maybe there's less kind of internship level or, or junior level jobs right now. Um, so I'd love to, to hear if you have any uh, insights on, on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I do think that the majority of the jobs that you do see um, online are kind of more the mid-level and senior ones. It doesn't mean that there aren't positions out there. It just means that you kind of have to go that extra step to get a position now as well. And you really need to, um, you, you kind of need to network. You just need to connect people, you really do your research, know what you're going for, know what area of UX you're going for as well. Um, it, it is difficult, I think, with any um, areas to get your foot in the door. But I think if you really have a strong portfolio, know exactly what you want to go for, know the people who can kind of open doors for you and um, and just keep trying, I, I do think that, that, you know, you will get there as well, for sure. I mean, I, I'd just like to add to that as well. Like, I mean, uh, just backing up that point, Jerry, like uh, that there is a lack of visibility of junior roles on the market. And obviously, uh, you know, in my role, this is a, a key factor for a lot of our students. We do have to actually search out for those those junior roles. So one of one of the key factors in why it's actually not too visible is the fact that there is uh, an addition, well, the, not an additional cost, but that the cost to recruit for for a junior role is roughly about the same as it would be for a mid-level to senior role, whereas the priority tends to lie on the, the mid-level to senior role. Um, from an economic standpoint for, for recruitment firms, there's not much incentive to go for junior positions because the the, the relative pay payout for that service is quite low. But at the same time, advertising a junior role on a, on a jobs board is actually the return on investment for that is actually quite low as well. So ten, it, the tendency is to actually have junior roles either rolled into an existing 
uh, mid-level uh, mid uh, job description or uh, place it directly on the, the careers portal of the, the company site. So they, they are not visible to the vast majority of people unless they know where to look for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess what you're saying is they are out there, but but maybe the, not the ones that we're going to see most most frequently. Yeah, and uh, to, to to kind of back that up, I suppose we have been seeing a kind of consistent rate of placements as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think last year it was uh, it was seventy nine percent of our our graduates did manage to get a job within six months. So the jobs are there. It's it's not really a, a, com a complete lack. So. Okay, great. Um, and I think then, you know, just we're, we're kind of coming up to the last couple of minutes on, on this topic, but I'd love to ask maybe Dave, given your, your position and experience, you know, for, for university and college professionals who are, um, you know, joining us this evening, how can they prepare students to take advantage of this increasing demand? Or, you know, what advice might, might we have for, for them? Well, I think, you know, we, we need to accept what, what the future is going to be. And we know that UX is, is a part of that future. And I think we need to be start thinking about how do we train students in the environment? Like, are we looking at user research? Are we looking at prototyping? Are we looking at usability and design thinking processes? And how do we train these students into those spaces and leveraging the tools around us? One of the things that, that we see for the future is as we look around, for an example, with UX design institution, how can we partner with institutions that are way ahead of the curve and are agilely changing the content and the elements to bring that into the classroom to make sure that we're on, we're on point, we're hitting all those, those points. I think the other piece too is, and as we say that three years experience, I think we as institutions always need to look at how do we bring in work integrated learning? How do we bring in pieces where the students can start building a portfolio once they've got this knowledge and how do they go out and actually work and start mentoring under, under these senior people and, and in order to set them up for success as they're leaving the institution. Okay, great. Thanks, Dave. Um, Perfect. Owner Jer Jerry, I don't know if, if you have, have much to, to add to, to that final point. I guess from my perspective, I would just pick up on the on the point you made around kind of the, the pace of updating content and, and how quickly, you know, things change in this industry um, and how vital it is that content is constantly being iterated on. You know, that's something that we really have to have to consider uh, a lot. That content remains up to date with where the industry is at. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I always wrestle with in being in an institution, Rachel, is that, you know, yes, there's textbooks, there's those elements, but are they are they relevant? Are they up to date? Are they meeting those elements? So you need the support system of the content and the content pieces in order for us to be on point to help these individuals and these students get jobs after. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, I think I think we'll finish up on that topic there, guys. Um, unless anybody has any final comments to make. No, perfect. Okay, great. So what we're going to talk about next then is specifically educational requirements for a career in UX. So what what do you need to have to to stand out to to get the job? Um, and this was something we were really interested in, kind of uh, getting an answer to in in our our report. Um, so what we found was um, just under 80% of hiring managers would look for a UX specific educational qualification. So, so they'd like to see that. Um, but what we found was they're not necessarily looking for the, the degree level of education. So just over half said they'd look for either a certificate or diploma level in UX, 23% um, bachelor's degree in UX, just 2% would be looking for a, a master's uh, level of, of UX education. Um, and then just over 80% uh, agree that having this education is, is beneficial when starting out in UX. Um, and then we also looked to the perspective of, of those who have actually gotten the jobs themselves in the, in the last four years. And 71% of them said that their education was important in helping them get that, that first job. Um, so that's kind of the, the background for what we're gonna discuss now. Um, and what, what we're going to talk about specifically is, you know, our panelists' uh, understanding of why hiring managers place so much importance on formal education in, in UX. Um, um, we've, we've kind of touched on this, but also, you know, how important it is to ensure that education is, is current and industry relevant. Um, 
And then again, how can how can college and university professionals prepare their students to, to enter the job market? So how can they ensure that their students are learning the skills that they're going to need so that they can hit the ground running when, when they land into a job? Um, so I guess we'll we'll start kind of, you know, with 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 what you think is is why why is it important? You know, why why do they look for this kind of education? Um, and whoever would like to to kick us off, please don't be shy. <laughs> I, I can yeah go <laughs> sure um I, I do think it's uh to do with just kind of the basics and the foundations um as well um a lot of people pivot to ux from other areas you know as as owen was saying i mean it's it's so it's it's kind of meshing with um marketing digital marketing now or analytics you see on, on another side um and you'll get some people who will think of UX, but they, I mean, it's, it's, it's design is huge, basically, as well. And they might understand uh, a part of design, say, for example, visual design. Um, and you'll see that on portfolio sometimes if they go in for a UX position. Um, but they're lacking the kind of the whole design process as well and, and really understanding that. Um, and although that you can be a kind of a, a self-taught designer at design, because it is so big, I do think it is beneficial to have at least that kind of uh, a diploma. And then within these courses, um, they tell you, you know, these are articles, these are books, these are different things to read. So you can kind of continuously learn, but it is it is important to kind of have that, um, just that, that basic of just saying, this is kind of the, the foundations of, of design as well. I'd also say, I mean, design 15 years ago, it was, it was very hands-on with the same as engineering or architecture. So it has kind of pivoted. And I think that it's, it's one of those areas where it's become really popular um but it to stand out is really just to bring it back to basics and that and you know just become like a, a solid designer i would say in that way and i, I think education is, is definitely the, the the top way to go with that yeah and i think you know one of the things i think when we look at ux and i think we're going to have to look even more critical at these pieces is and around data analytics and making smart, smart decisions. And I think what we need to do is have a, a combination of creative problem solving and critical thinking skills. And those creative problems like, yes, yeah, so you might have a background in design, but then how do you take the design into, into actual critical thinking on how to solve the problem and with right problem? Meaning, is this the point of view of the organization? Is the value set of the organization? Is the story of this organization? And how can we match this design into that that point of view, um, and I think that comes into the elements of that educational piece. You need that critical, creative thinking, um, in that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree as well. But I, I would also back that up as uh, not just with the the critical thinking, creativity, but also in terms of the facts that UX is very very inherently based on data. It needs yeah. to actually come from a, a place of solid research and not just. Uh, identifying problems as a result of research, but actually delving into the detail, fundamentally understanding why it's a problem. Um, and that that is one of those those points that t time and time again comes up uh, with with regards to some of, uh, some of our students getting hired. They have delved deeply into the nature of the key problems and pain points that the, the, uh, the project's trying to solve and, and really kind of finding solutions that not only understand the user-centered nature but also understand the uh the fundamental technology problems that that the, that the approaches can help solve you know uh, if that makes sense i kind of muddled my words there a little bit <laughs> no no it definitely makes sense Owen. um and i i think from you know what everybody is is kind of saying is almost this is kind of like key not only to standing out but to be successful when you land land in a job and I guess related to this, I'd love to know your thoughts on, you know, what are the core skills that somebody needs to learn or or have breaking into this industry? Like, you know, I'm sure it's a mix of both soft skills and hard skills. But, mm. um, you know, what what would, uh, you know, if we're thinking of the context of university and college professionals, what skills do they need to be teaching to to set their students up for success? 
I mean, fundamentally, for from my side of things, one of the one of the key factors with regards to the the so, uh, the hard skills that you're you're gaining from a general UX education, some of the key points are actually becoming an excellent communicator. Uh, so, strong communication skill set, being able to actually deal with a range of stakeholders from uh, from the technical side through to the uh, com completely non-technical stakeholders or members of the public. Um, you know, the, this is fundamentally a career path where interaction with people is a, a core uh, core aspect of, of the role. Um, so that's often where I see a lot of deficits, a lot of communication skill sets um, aren't as well developed as uh, as I'd like to see when, when people are starting out. But, you know, from a solid UX or, or focused education or user-centered user education, um, the, the, the core skill set of being able to communicate the core principles of your design approaches or the rationale behind the key decisions and get buy-in from key stakeholders in the organization. Um, that, that's kind of where I see one of the, the, the major crossovers between soft and hard skills, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think the other piece is like, and leading into what Owen's saying is it's the, it's the strategic piece. It's like, you got to be strategic. You got to be just, you got to be thinking strategically about, and then you also have to have the insight of having some kind of a business mindset because there is the return on investment. There is this element and more and more businesses are getting more critical with the, where the spend is and how is the spend contributing to, to, uh, to uh, getting more conversions. Yeah, absolutely. And just on that, Dave, I mean, whenever I'm speaking to hiring managers there, you know, if, if I say, well, what would you like to see kind of from portfolios and, and with candidates and they'll say, um, you know, data and it's not data just for the sake of it. It is for that value add of the company, you know, and it's, you know, I think when actually putting together a portfolio, you need to kind of think of your of the hiring managers and the recruiters as your users so that we can kind of read it well as well. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something. The ability to understand good and bad, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so in, in, in our state of UX hiring report, um, you know, one of the questions we asked, we kind of put a, a list of, of both a mix of soft and hard skills in front of, of uh, hiring managers and, and asked them to rank them in importance. And the, the kind of top three that stood out were actually soft skills. Um, so, you know, we're talking uh, problem solving, collaboration, teamwork, uh, those kind of things. Um, but when you go beyond the soft skills, there's also then the importance of, you know, there are some hard technical skills. Um, so what came through was really UI and visual design. Um, and that's something I've, I've heard a little bit myself about having that ability to really, um, you know, take a design to, to a high fidelity um, and, you know, is that something you would you would also see as, as being in demand apart from these kind of strategic skills? I, th I think the thing I don't want to be lost is that there are some some skills that ultimately you must have to be a successful UX professional. <clears throat> Oh, absolutely. I mean, apart from the strategic and the data, they still need to be a good designer at the end of the day and, and, and give good design and be creative. And so then there, there is that element of it. So that's, I mean, like, yeah, of course you have all that, but at the end of the day, it's, it's still someone who has an eye for design, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, okay. And so then thinking about, you know, from the perspective of, of university and college professionals, you know, going back to how can, how can they prepare students for this job market, um, you know, how can they try to ensure that that students are are ready for, um, you know, breaking into what is there's no denying it a, a popular career choice. You know, there's there's real benefits to to a career in UX and and I guess like any sought after career, there are there can be competition for for roles. So I guess you know we've touched on on some of this already, but kind of to to wrap up that topic of um preparing students is there anything we ha we haven't touched on that you think is is really important for uh university and college professionals to to know uh, go ahead go ahead you, you go ahead <laughs> well i'm just I, the one thing that comes to mind and i think you know it, it is all about application you talk about soft and hard skills where do they get those soft and hard skills they need the application they need the element to have the space to play 
And the institution is a great place for them to play, either leveraging your network of, of clients that are within your community, your, your institution, and having those students go out and work with them. They also need the opportunity to build their portfolio. If they're going to go out and get a job, they need an opportunity to showcase what they've done, what they've learned. I'd also say like one of one of the key issues that I actually see with a lot of a lot of UX graduates is they don't really understand the the value of their previous experience as well. Uh, quite often, domain specific knowledge that they've acquired through previous careers actually can be a major advantage when when it comes to applying. So it can actually help them get the foot in the door. Um, once they're aware of this as well, it builds a lot of, of confidence in their skill set uh, and they, they feel a lot more comfortable actually going into a, a, an environment where they're actually going to be able to apply that skill set on projects as well. So um, I, I suppose that that's one of the, the key things I would say is really essential for, for I suppose, preparing, preparing graduates for, for starting their careers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, Owen, and also uh, what you touched on, Dave, around, you know, actually applying these skills. Um, and I think that's, you know, certainly something that I would hear a lot is the question of how do I get experience? How do I demonstrate, you know, I've, I've learned this theory, how do I show what I can do with it? Um, and a question that comes up a lot is, can you get into UX without, you know, work experience? Are there other ways that you can show your experience, showcase yourself. Um, so I'd love to know any thoughts or ideas um, any of you have on on that, you know, what are the creative ways to, to kind of get the attention if you maybe don't have the previous experience working for a company, let's say. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what I would say to that is when I do speak to hiring managers, they do say that they would prefer if people could re solve real life problems and of course you're saying well you know how do I get experience if they're not allowing me in because I don't have experience like you know those <clears throat> questions but a lot of people have you know if, if you have a friend um, or someone who has an app or a website and you can just you know you could you could ask them you can also um, you you can you know if you really want to get into this I think as well you can kind of I, I we had a candidate recently who uh, volunteered um, for a few months to kind of work on the UI side, then got uh, a position. And actually going back to what um, Owen said, um, I was able to kind of leverage the experience, previous experience as well, as well as that. And th although the job uh, description would have said two or three years experience in UX, hiring managers is more lenient than you think with that as well, um, if you actually can prove that what you've done would actually be um, useful for the, for the role as well. Uh, so I would also also say to to people not to be too put off by by years of experience um, as well. I, I would back that up. Generally, years of experience is more of a guideline than anything else. And and typically, what people don't really realize is that years of experience could actually be coming from you know being able to navigate in the business environment, not necessarily just uh, being part of a design team, for example. Uh, although. The, the closer aligned it is, the better. Um, but yeah, uh, in addition to that, I, I, I think, um, it, it, sorry, I've lost the, my train of thought there, so. No, that's okay, Owen. I think, um, you know, I know uh, Owen was also one of our, our contributors on the report, and I think, you know, something that, um, that you said that really stood out to me was that kind of piece around it being almost like a wish list and, and not to, not to be totally thrown off by that. Um, but I think also the message around, you know, don't underplay your previous experience, find out how it can be relevant to UX. Um, you know, we've we've included in the report as well, some quotes from, from people who have moved into UX. And, and one I loved was uh, from a singer songwriter who said, you know, being able to finish a song means you have to be both a problem solver and creative and so they they spoke to that in in their portfolio and now is working as a ux lead for a company so i think maybe there's something around not underestimating that that previous experience is is kind of um one of the things that stood out to me um so i have a couple of questions here from the audience that i'm gonna i'm gonna hand pick out here um so one one that I, I want to touch on because we did touch on the, in the report as well is around um, networking um, and and just the importance of networking and I think people 
um, you know, sometimes aren't sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and what one person has asked in particular is, um, you know, is it okay to reach out to a, a, a recruiter or a hiring manager on LinkedIn or connect with them after submitting a, an application? Um, and and Jerry, I guess you're probably uh, very well positioned to, to give a position on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I think with that, um, so, you know, from, from my point of view, if I put a job ad up, you can you can see the, I always say, you know, you can get in contact with me via email as well. Um, and sometimes, obviously, there could be like 200 applicants, so it is difficult to get back to everyone. But the way to make yourself stand out is instead of just uh, like adding the, um, the recruiter on LinkedIn, I would actually then go ahead and email, introduce yourself briefly. I mean, it's, it's kind of, and just, and also have your CV and portfolio there as well, because you're more likely to actually get a response from someone if they don't have to go looking for something. Because sometimes I have people who will say, I applied for a job, but then that makes me have to go look for their um, the, their portfolio, their CV. So if they're actually giving it to me and I'm busy, then I'm like, yeah, okay, that looks great. I'm more likely to get in touch. So just make it as easy as possible as you can for both the recruiter and the, um, uh, the hiring manager as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Owen, were you going to say something there? So yeah, I mean, I I, I definitely kind of align uh, align with Jerry on that. Uh, the the one thing I would probably want to add to that is is like networking in general is actually going to be a strong benefit. So, uh, one of the key aspects of when I uh, when I'm advising some of our graduates on on how to actually go about applying or networking is specifically actually network with people within the company that you're planning on applying to. Um, it can actually be very beneficial to kind of get internal referrals. So the only way you're going to be able to do that is by making connections within within that that company and within the within the team. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be utilizing it at that point in time for that particular job, uh, but you are basically cultivating a network of people that you can actually leverage at a later point when you are applying. Um, if you have a uh, an existing uh, existing relationship with someone, it, you're not just chasing after them because you want something. You're actually coming into a, a situation where you've already cultivated that relationship. It's been mutually beneficial. And then when you're ready to apply, they can actually vouch for you, which can really add to your chances of actually securing an interview. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I'm a big advocate for networking. And I think the networking element and even going to get informational sessions, so finding people. But if you're going to do this, please find the value in your relationship. Please say, look for the value you can offer them and exchange the value you, that you're trying to get out of it. So it's not a one-way relationship, it's a two-way relationship. And that two-way relationship will open up other doors for you, for sure. Okay, great. Um, so we're gonna move on to the topic of AI in just a second, but before we do, there's just one more question from, from the audience that I just wanna to touch on. And it's asking, you know, for recommendations or thoughts for current university students who say are pursuing um, a non-technical or non-marketing degree and would they benefit from adding UX to their education and um, to, to better support their their kind of job applications and, and and to set themselves up for when they do graduate I guess and and Dave I can see you nodding so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to you on this one well, well, you know, Rachel, I think it comes down to like, you know, we've, we've talked about UX, we're talking about product design and service design and that element, but we also have this other side of things. It's called the CX of things, customer experience. We're starting to see that evolution of businesses taking more of an internal look at this element and saying, how can I better serve internally? And the UX is the foundation of going there. The UX is of moving towards those elements and then internal elements. So I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a door opener for multiple different areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess from from my personal experience, and it's 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 just a personal anecdote, but uh, my background was in psychology, and I think the longer I I work in UX, the more I wish there had been some some content, some some route in, because a lot of people leave psychology as an example, not knowing really where to go with that, and it took me a couple of years to find UX. Whereas had I left college, maybe with that toolkit. I would have been kind of nicely set up to, to hit the industry more job ready, I think. Yeah, totally, Rachel. I was about to use psychology as an example because a lot of people go into UX research then and it pairs really, really nicely. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, okay, well, guys, thank you so much for your contributions on that topic. I'm going to jump into to AI now as our, our last discussion point and just share some some stats on this. Um, so, you know, really with this report, we kind of wanted to cut, up, cut through the hype a bit around AI. Um, you know, we'll caveat this whole conversation with, with the fact that there's definitely an, an element of hype cycle going on. Um, but beneath that, AI is fundamentally going to, to change not only the UX industry, but I think most industries. Um, so we found that nearly three quarters of UX professionals are already using AI monthly or more often. Um, nearly 70% said they found AI useful so far. Um, and when we filtered that data and looked just at those people using it uh, either daily or weekly, that figure jumped up to 95% saying they found it useful so far. Um, we don't have the stat, stat here on screen, but just to give um, an extra level of understanding, we also asked, you know, which tools are you actually using? And ChatGBT was just the standout uh, tool being used um, that was mentioned by nearly three quarters of respondents. Um, and interestingly, just over half of UX professionals are more excited than concerned about AI. Um, and I think, you know, we in the report, we have commentary from from experts working in AI right now. And and one of our experts um, actually said that this stat in particular just encapsulates where the industry is at right now. You know, we're really at this tipping point where, um, you know, there's a nervousness, but at the same time, there's an excitement. And I think UX professionals in particular are kind of at the forefront of this be because of the work we do. Um, and, and how important it's, it's going to be to make sure that AI is is a positive user experience rather rather than a negative one. Um, but what I'd love for us to talk about is a bit about predictions for for how AI will impact the industry and in particular the hiring landscape. Um, and then importantly, how can university and college professionals best prepare students for this impact of AI? and um, I guess make sure that they are prepared to go into an industry that is is undergoing a lot of change right now. Um, so over to you guys, whoever is, is going to speak first. <laughs> well, I, I think in, 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 in a lot of industries at the moment, there's this fear that AI is going to take over the world and there's not going to be any human jobs left. But I, I just, it's not going to happen. Like, you know, um, I do think that um, people, it, it, look, as we as this is kind of predicting so we're not completely sure but I, I do think that AI will um it will actually benefit designers or benefit recruiters it's going to benefit people more and I think people who embrace it who start learning the tools um they're going to be the ones who kind of stand out as well because they're going to be working smarter they're going to be working faster um you know it's really there's a, you know designers spend a lot of time with wireframes and screens and I think oh, that's going to really speed that up so actually it will allow people to do a lot more on the research side where there's actually interviewing people um and I do think that that it's it's going to act as kind of a like a, a junior designer because it can kind of it'll act as like a, an assistant basically for people mm -hmm. it's going to be the co-pilot it's going to be the co-pilot. It's the assistant. It's a tool. It's got, you know, like we look, it's, it's going to be great at data analytics. It's going to be great at denializing. It's going to be great at predicting and modeling and all that element. But it's a tool and it's a tool to help. But there's still the humanistic piece of this. There's the empathy. There's creativity. There's all these other pieces that we know as humans that AI is not going to get. There's always going to be humanistic piece piece of this element. And again, uh, as, as Jerry was saying, it's like, it is a tool. It's a tool to enhance creativity. I mean, to enhance the creativity of health, has the perspective, enhance all these elements to make us more efficient, more effective. I'd like to add to that, that in that, like, all of that is very true, but like this, this anxiety over new technologies coming in all the time, that's been happening as long as humans have been around. Basically, we can look at we can look at uh, kind of the the technology development development in the 1800s where they you know people were building railroads by hand and then suddenly the steam drill came along so everyone thought they were going to be losing their jobs but no the the jobs continued it just meant we could actually build the railroads faster uh, and more effectively um, but the the skills needed in order to use the tool in order to get that level of efficiency. Oh, it, it required a development of a new skill set. And the same actually is, stands for AI. Uh, one of the fundamental 
misconceptions people have is that generative AI will take over the work that uh, the creative people are doing. But the reality is you still have to think logically. You have to understand how to engineer a prompt to get the result that you're looking for. So this means that while we are reducing the, the overall workload and time it takes to, to do a, a certain set of uh, tasks, you still need to apply a, a strict logic and creativity in a different function. So we're just changing the way we work, not not the the we're not getting rid of the jobs essentially. And I and I also one other thing that I think that we always need to be considering is that we've got to think of the efficacy or the ethical pieces of it. Like what's real, what's not real, what's the right data, what's the right information. Like even what we're you know these things are learning. These machines are still learning and learning and learning. What's we have to really help understand what's the information that we really need and what's 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 going to help us tell our point of view yeah all, all really good points and i think you know thinking about the the preparation element of this and and particularly how you know universities and colleges can kind of try to prepare students uh we actually had a, a webinar um two weeks ago with jacob nielsen one of the the usability pioneers in in ux and he was talking about, you know, start today, start small, but start today because, um, and, and I'm, I'm stealing his quote here, but and I'm sure people have heard it from, from other sources, but the reality is that AI won't take your job, but somebody with AI knowledge and expertise might. Um, so I, I'd just love to know uh, your inputs on that um, and, and whether you agree with, with Jacob's point of view, you know, start now, um, or or what you think. Well, you should have started a while back, but yeah, start now, start today, because this is the future. We need to, we like like the panelists have talked about here. We need to learn how to prompt this effectively, uh, and it actually probably needs the whole freaking degree in prompting, uh, because that's what the next evolution is going to be. We need to get on, and we need to understand these tools as best as we can, and leverage how we can use them to support us. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I completely agree with that. Like, I mean, we, we do need to learn how to use these tools. It, it's, it's a skill set that needs to be developed. But I mean, for example, the, the same logic applies to say programming. Programming has enabled us to, to do amazing things with, with computers, but you still need to understand the, the logic of, of the programming language. I mean, the, the fundamental logic doesn't really change, but the, the, the complexity and ease of use of the different programming languages does. So for example, uh, back in the day, people were using COBOL uh, for, for large mainframes. And now uh, people are using things like Python, which are much, much easier to understand. It's simply we've we've gone to a higher level understanding of how to interact. That, that's simply it. But the, the fundamental underlying skills and underst uh, understanding how the the processes work, that's that's kind of the essential there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I don't think that the tools can replace the rationale and the work that you've done behind it. But if you have, you know, like at the moment, Figma is kind of what's more used than Adobe XD. And, and I think Envision have said that they're closing down this year or something. So mm -hmm. it's, it, there's no point being scared of what's going to, to, to come up. It's just learn it. If you have two designers, they're both fantastic, really creative, but one has the tools and one doesn't, which company is going, are they going to, you know, what, which person is the company going to pick obviously the person who has the tools so yeah definitely um get on it basically as well yeah <laughs> okay great and so there's a question here um that i think is really relevant to 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 what we're talking about and it's a question of should universities and colleges start to slowly embrace ai into cur curriculums or would this take away from the creativity uh from students actually doing the work so being a university professor, uh, right, this is this is an ongoing dialogue that's in most institutions right now is the element of plagiarism and, you know, what's what's uh, but at the end of the day, I think it needs to be the starting tool. I think it's the, the beginning of like, OK, the student at least got to the AI element and now can build their critical thinking from there. Like it's a it's a create it's a creative tool that can help spur ideas and yes institutions need to figure out how to instill it into the curriculum to get to get our students thinking even more critical going even more bringing more creativity to this element because if that's the starting point that's where we need to grow from. 
Okay, great. And I guess, you know, in terms of, of starting points and, and um, you know, our, from our survey, we saw ChatGPT coming out on top. Is is that what we see most most people starting to begin this exploration with? Have, have any of you come across others, maybe either through CVs, applications, or what, what you're seeing in the industry? Um, are there any other standout tools? Um, or is it very much kind of uh, everybody needs to kind of just start exploring and, and, and see uh, what they find? There hasn't been standout standout apart from chat GBC. I guess that, that that was the kind of, you know, um, uh, especially the one for, for last year. And I think that it's going to be, it's just, it, as you said, I think it's going to be exploring and I think it's going to, there's just different tools will, will come up as well. So it'll be really interesting, I think, to see what's going to come in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think ChatGDP definitely is is winning the race. There is this. There's Gemini that that definitely has that element. I think the, another one that's really sort of catching eyes is Claude. Is the next one. I think Claude's got some really interesting pieces to it that is very similar to ChatGDP, um, and is getting some. It's mostly getting traction in the U Europe and the US. Okay. Nice. And I think you know, Jerry, you mentioned Figma as well, and I think. Um, you know, one of the things we're going to see as well is not specifically AI tools, but design tools incorporating elements of, of AI. And I think that's an, another area to, to, you know, for people to start exploring. Um, I know there are some tools that will kind of help with copywriting for interface or, you know, different things like that. So it's like, I feel like we're at this point where we're waiting to see what the, you know, design leaders in the space come up with, with, with all of this. Absolutely. Um, okay, and so I guess, you know, ultimately to wrap up this conversation, I'd love to know just, and um, we're purely talking predictions, but, um, you know, thinking about designing for AI, you know, so the opportunities that will exist for UX designers to, to actually design AI experiences, you know, do, do you have any insights on on that and i guess i'll just kick off by saying one of the the insights from jacob nielsen as well from from that webinar was that the user experience right now is pretty poor you know yeah. th these interfaces are are not made with the user in mind and i think owen you made the point earlier as well that they're also being thrown out real really quickly mm -hmm. um, so i guess from my point of view i i see huge potential for user you know ux professionals to really lead the charge in this space, but I'd, I'd I'd love to know what 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 you all think. Well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna reference back to my early days in the world of e-commerce and online. If we go back and look 20, 30 years ago, look at the website. Look at the website today. You know, at why? Because of UX designers. Because of that. Before we we start to realize that hey, it's more customer centric, and we need to be more focus on the customer and get the information across the customer and getting the customer engaged. Uh, I, I think there's lots of opportunity AI modeling and with UX is going to be brilliant, leveraging the analytics, the data collection, the patterns, and then building like tools that actually can interact with, with, uh, with those, the target audience. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really ex like exciting space for a lot of uh, companies moving forward and, and a lot of, um, you know, you've, you see customer experience, but everything's becoming experience now. So there's brand experience, there's immersive experience. So, and that's, so really what AI, and we're only at the start of this kind of AI revolution as well. So where does it go in the next few years? It's, it, it's actually really open for a lot of innovation out there. So I think it's really exciting. I mean, I'd, I'd say as well at the moment, like the, we are seeing a lot of a lot of AI applications just being thrown at the wall to see what sticks. And un unfortunately that that can be a negative, but at the same time, this is a new way of interacting with technology. At the end of the day, we need to actually make mistakes in order to understand how to actually do this better. Um, so I think though what is happening and one of the advantages, uh, advantages of UX professionals is that we have learned from from situations in the past where, you know, new technology was adopted, mistakes were made, and we have learned some of the patterns that will be applicable to, to, to AI. We're still gonna make mistakes moving forward, but the technology will mature a lot faster than I think people realize as well. 
Great. Um, well, guys, we are just about to come up on time. Um, so I just want to take a moment to thank you, Owen, Jerry, and Dave for, for your contributions. It's been a really, really interesting conversation and I, I, I'm sure it's been really helpful for, for our audience. Um, before I kind of end the, the session, just to, to mention again, um, for anybody that's interested, we're going to share a link uh, now in the chat, um, you know, where you can find out more just about the kind of partnership models um, that we offer to suit your institution, whether it be a, a college, university, um, we have a range of partnership models to suit kind of, I guess, uh, any any type of institution. So we're going to share that link uh, in the chat now. Um, and all that's left to say, once again, guys, thank you so much for, for joining me and uh, for, for all of your, your insights. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you as well. Thank, thank you. you. It's really great.